Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for inviting me, Adam. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I think, yeah, the, the detail is the, the problem, actually, because there's such a, well, there's a diversity of crops in horticulture, and there's even greater diversity of pests. So, so it's about sort of how, how to pitch it today. And I could probably talk about diamondback moth for an hour, but um, yeah, so it's going to be a bit more general than that. So next slide, please. Okay, so um, I've worked on pests for more years than I care to, to think about, um, and most of the time I've been based at Wellsbourne in, in Warwickshire, um, and that started off as the National Vegetable Research Station, um, and in fact we're, we're celebrating this year 70 years of horticultural research, well, research on vegetables at the Wellsbourne site. Um, and then we became um, Warwick HRI when we merged with some of the other horticultural research institutes. Um, and then, and it, all of this is related to funding, um, and then it sort of started to fall apart and uh, we were taken on by Warwick University in 2004 um, and we became part of the School of Life Sciences in 2010. Um, but I'm still based at Wellsbourne, um, there are quite a few of us still based at Wellsbourne, and we now call ourselves Warwick, Warwick Crop Centre. Um, and I've worked on a whole range of um, different aspects of, of pest control with, with colleagues all, uh, all the time. So I'm going to talk about integrated pest management later on, and I've probably worked on most of the, the tools that you might use in different ways. And yeah, and one thing to say, sorry, last slide is that I guess one of the, the sort of outward facing things I do at the moment is I um, uh, produce the AHDB pest bulletin. Does anybody use the, the pest bulletin? Hooray, one at the back. Um, so that's, um, you, can, you can Google that. Um, it's, it's online and it's um, a summary of, of sort of all the key pests of, of vegetables. Um, about their activity. So some of it is, is forecasting, some of it is, is sort of real-time monitoring. Um, so although it's hosted by the dark side, Syngenta, um, it, you know, it's worth looking at if you're interested in what, what's going on with pests. Sorry, next one. Right, so what I'm going to talk about is first of all I'm going to talk a bit about pest life cycles and their biology and their natural enemies. I'm going to talk just a bit about impacts of climate change. Um, I'm going to then talk about the tools available currently that are sort of relevant to organic growers um, and what the future might look, in, look like in terms of pest control. Um, and then I'm going to talk about um, diversity in the, the widest sense um, and why I think that's the, the way forward. Um, and then as we go along, some thoughts about how what, what organic and conventional growers can learn from one another because I think you know, there's stuff to learn both both ways. And uh, then afterwards, please ask questions. Right, thank you. Right, so first of all, I'm going to talk about pest and natural enemy life cycles. Uh, and next slide, please. And um, I guess start with the basics. So probably you all did the, the life cycle of the butterfly at, at school, which is complete metamorphosis. Um, so, uh, insects that have complete metamorphosis exist in four stages. The adult, which might be a fly or a butterfly or a moth. Um, the egg stage, the larval stage, which is quite often the stage that, that does the damage. And then the pupal stage, or the chrysalis in, in the butterfly. Um, there are some insects, like aphids, that have a simpler life cycle, so they don't have the, the pupal stage and that's incomplete metamorphosis. Next slide, please. So how do insects reproduce? Um, that's very important to all of us because that's when the problems start. Um, so um, a lot of insects reproduce by sexual reproduction. So there are males and females. They mate. Um, and then through mating, the genes get mixed up. Um, and so new combinations can lead to, to new possibilities, if you like. Um, some insects, or sometimes some sort of phases of certain insects, they reproduce asexually, um, so they don't need to, to mate. Um, the female produces usually live young, um, and the mother and the offspring are genetically 
identical. So you can produce clones, or they produce clones, um, and that can sometimes be really bad news um, for people who use insecticides. Um, if there's a clone um, that's selected for, um, that is resistant to a particular insecticide, then their numbers can rapidly um, increase and control with that insecticide can, can break down. Um, and then some species produce eggs, and so, as I said, some produce live young. Next slide, please. So here are just some pictures of, of insect eggs. So um, moth egg on the left-hand side, cabbage moth, so sort of round eggs laid in a batch on a leaf. Cabbage root fly eggs, um, I'm sure some of you have seen those laid around the, the, base, of the base of the plant in the soil. Next slide, please. Um, and aphid eggs, which I bet none of you have seen. Has anybody ever seen an aphid egg? No? Um, so generally that's um, the overwintering stage of some aphids and again I'll talk about that a bit more in, in a minute um, and so that's often the, the cold resistant stage of aphids so that's how they survive very very hard winters. Next slide please. And then yeah rather diddly pictures of live young so you probably can't see it very well but where the yellow arrow is that's a um, a baby current lettuce aphid um, that's just been produced and then there are some baby um, cabbage aphids on the, the right hand side um, and aphids as you all know um, can reproduce pretty pretty rapidly and more about that later as well okay next slide please um, so in terms of the life cycle of individual species um, then there's a whole range of variations on the, the sort of basic life cycle. Um, it depends on their, their host plants sometimes, what they're feeding on, and also the, the climate, um, seasonality, uh, and weather conditions. And a key thing, which is something that, that I've spent a lot of time on, is the fact that insects are cold-blooded. So the rate at which they develop um, depends usually on the temperature of their surroundings and basically until you get to a very high temperature the, the hotter it is the faster they develop so the more life cycles they'll go through in a period of, of time and that's very relevant for, for climate change. Next slide please. So how do um, insects survive adverse conditions. Obviously, um, most of the species that feed on your crops, um, there's nothing for them to eat during the winter. Um, so somehow they've got to get through it. Um, so most insect species that, that live in, in temperate climates, they become dormant in winter. It's usually in, in one particular um, stage. Um, and the technical term for at least one type of dormancy is, is diapause. Has anybody heard of diapause before? And um, if insects are going into diapause, then they actually usually anticipate the weather, so it's the, the winter, so it's not in response to the cold conditions. They detect that winter is coming, either through decreasing day length, um, <laughs> Or, and or decreasing temperatures. So they're actually getting into the dormant state before um, the cold conditions arrive. Um, there's also, they can just sort of slow their development down if it gets very cold. Say we have a cold snap in the spring uh, and they're actually sort of out and about, then their development will just slow and some of them, uh, we might say they become quiescent. So they just sort of become slow and, and unresponsive. Next slide, please. Um, and again, relevant to climate change, um, they also um, need, and, and will need in future, um, to be able to survive um, very hot, dry conditions. Um, and so, quite often, again, certain species will become dormant uh, when it becomes very hot, and this is termed estivation. Um, and again, uh, some of these species actually um, maybe not anticipate so much, but they, yeah, they respond quite quickly to, to high temperatures. And the cabbage root fly, for example, it estivates in the pupal stage. So if it's a newly formed pupa when it gets very hot, then it will stop 
developing whilst soil temperatures remain um, high. Um, and that's usually above 20, and the higher it is above 20, the greater the proportion of the pupae that, that east evade. So it's just a way of avoiding um, high, high, well, adverse conditions. Next slide, please. So the way these life cycles, if you like, translate into what you see in the field are as here for the cabbage root fly, my not very good diagrams. Um, so they spend the winter in diapause as a pupa. The adult fly comes out in the spring, lays eggs around host plants. The eggs develop into larvae, maggots that cause the damage. They form pupae. Another lot of flies come out, the second generation, go through the cycle again. And then as we get towards the, the autumn, the earliest sort of developing insects of the second generation, they probably haven't received the cue yet, the, the, the decreased day length, the, the critical day length to tell them to go into diapause. So they will go on and complete a third generation. But the later ones um, will actually get that message at the right time and then they'll go into diapause and spend the winter as, as a diapause pupa. So next slide, please. Um, and so another way of sort of expressing that is, is by, if you're monitoring insects, this is, this is the sort of pattern that you often get. So this is, this is carrot fly captures on sticky traps at, at Wellsbourne. Um, so just the same idea as the cabbage root fly. So first, second, and third generation. And as you all know, our sort of average temperatures are increasing year on year. And what that's meaning for the carrot fly is that we're getting a, a more significant, if you like, third generation at the, at the end of the year. And, and I'm sort of trying to figure out at the moment whether actually it, it actually causes further problems for growers, whether, although flies come out, whether they actually uh, manage to lay eggs because it's cooling down all the time, and whether those eggs, if they do lay any, um, turn into larvae that will, will cause damage. Next slide, please. Um, so there are also more complex life cycles, and, and aphids are quite a good example of, of that. Um, and again, their life cycles are determined by, by climate, by the weather, um, and also by their host plants. And there are a good number of species that, that alternate between a, a woody host plant, which they use in the winter, and um, a herbaceous or an herbaceous um, host plant that they use in the, in the summer. And an example of that, and the, the name is a giveaway, is the current lettuce aphid. Um, and basically it, it overwinters as eggs. So those eggs I showed you earlier on... Um, members of the current family, and then its summer hosts are lettuce, lettuce and some sort of related wild species as well. Next slide, please. Um, so most aphids also occur in a number of development, developmental forms. Um, so the adults may be winged or they may be wingless, and I'm sure you've seen both, both types on your crops. Um, and they may be sexual forms, so males, females that mate and then lay, the female lays eggs, or they may be the asexual females that, that produce live young. Um, next slide, please. So, a lot of species are very flexible, and um, the peach potato aphid, Mises persici, and again, I'm sure you will come across that one, um, it, it has, if you like, a different life cycle um, depending on where it lives in the world and it is quite widely distributed. In the UK, um, we have relatively mild winters and so basically it, it lives all year round in the mobile stages. So basically as asexual female aphids that then produce live young and they keep going through the winter they may have to change where they live um, because obviously some of the crops will disappear, but oilseed rape is a very good host for um, peach potato aphid and they'll all also overwinter on a whole range of, of weeds. Um, then if you go to somewhere like, say, Hungary um, that has very cold winters, um, then they, um, their life cycle changes a bit 
and in the autumn um, they produce the sexual forms, so the males and the females who mate, and then the females lay their eggs on, on peach trees, um, peach potato aphid. Um, and then, as I said, that's the cold resistant, very cold resistant stage, um, so that's how they survive the winter. And then the eggs hatch in the spring, they go through a, a sort of couple of asexual cycles on the peach, and then they'll produce winged forms that then fly off to the herbaceous hosts, which might be brassicas or peppers or whatever. <laughs> Next slide, please. Um, so, obviously, pests have become pests um, because they've been able to find and, and do very well on, on some of the plants that we grow for, for food. Um, but all of them must originally have had wild host plants somewhere. I and mean, obviously some of them have moved across the world and their host plants, their wild host plants, may be you know, somewhere else, not in the UK. Um, but in many cases, wild host plants um, still probably have a role in, in the sort of global life cycle of, of the pest. Um, and that may be by providing some sort of green bridge um, either in the winter or, or between crops or whatever um, that allows the, the pest to uh, continue. Um, but people have studied, um, not in enough detail yet, but, but have studied how certain pests perform on wild hosts. Um, for example, I had colleagues at Wellsbourne who looked at, at carrot fly and looked at a whole range of species, both cultivated and, and wild, potential hosts um, and usually wild species aren't such good hosts as the, as the cultivated species so by us selecting them for the characteristics that we we like we've also made them um, better hosts for the for the pests as well next slide please so another thing that's that's sort of quite important um, to us is to know how insects get about um, obviously, um, crops are rotated, and, and that's, I guess, one of the, the basic underlying principles of organic production in particular. Um, so it's useful to know how the insects will arrive. Um, and so that really depends on how well they can, they can fly. So some species are quite good, strong, independent flyers, so they can get out about quite well by themselves. So so cabbage root fly is one of those and can move, you know, a few kilometres at least. Um, moths and butterflies as, as well. Um, some fly more weakly, um, and one example of that is carrot fly. Um, and again, I'll talk a bit later about how you can exploit the fact that carrot fly um, doesn't fly very far. Um, some they are not strong flyers at all and where they go um, and how far they go uh, depend on the wind so they'll go up in the air and then they'll be, be carried wherever the, the wind blows and aphids and thrips I think are good examples of that um, and then the diamondback moth some species are, are migrants so diamondback moths can fly reasonably well um, but they can also travel great distances by going again high up and being carried by, by wind currents. Um, and at the moment, and again I'll say a bit more about it in a while, diamondback moth um, is what we call a migrant pest in the UK. It doesn't overwinter too well in the UK. It doesn't have a cold resistant stage. Um, and so the big influxes that we get are um, large numbers of moths that come from um, either continental Europe or, or North Africa um, and originally must have overwintered somewhere pretty, pretty warm and then sort of moved up country, maybe gone through a, through a generation. Um, and then you'll get this sort of event when the, there are plenty of moths somewhere and the wind blows in the, the right direction um, and then they arrive. And, and in 2016, um, which is what I was referring to, um, we had a huge influx and um, we were actually working on it at the time in an AHDB project and uh, we had a meteorologist working with us which was great um, and she managed to sort of 
using the, the wind direction to backtrack where those moths had come to the UK from. And um, although there were large numbers of moths all sort of down the, the west side of, of the continent, they actually came from Norway um, because that was the, the direction the wind was blowing at, at the time. Um, and now we run a, um, a system, again, for, for growers on the website, on our website, um, where there are a number of citizen science websites throughout Northern Europe where people record sightings of all sorts of species, including diamondback moth and silver wine moth. Um, and what AHDB does is they pay one of our students um, and he checks these websites every day and then summarises them on a web page um, so that growers can look there and see whether a, a big influx is on its way or has arrived. Next slide, please. Um, so the other thing, apart from how they get there, is how fast they, they reproduce. Um, and obviously, pest numbers increase if females produce large numbers of, of young or eggs. Um, and they also increase rapidly if, if the generation time is short, so it doesn't take them long to complete a life cycle. And then fecundity, so how many young they produce, is determined genetically. Um, but it also depends on the size of the female. And if the female has fed well, um, then she'll produce more young. And obviously, the longer she lives, um, the more young she's likely to produce. Um, Next slide, please. So a good example of, if you like, a, a rapidly developing pest is, is an aphid. It could be any aphid, but this is, this is cabbage aphid. Next slide, please. And somebody in Holland did a PhD a long time ago on, on cabbage aphid. And he worked out that in temperate countries, um, cabbage aphid could do between six and 11 life cycles, generations a year. Um, they could produce 30 offspring per generation on average. So I can never say these numbers, but one aphid could produce between, it's 10, I think it's 10 to the 9 or 10 to the 15 descendants in a year. So why aren't we up to our necks in, in aphids? Our next slide, please. And the reason is that quite a lot of them die. Um, and they die, the technical terms are abiotic, so non-biological, and biotic factors. So the abiotic factors, I guess, mainly relate to weather. So rainfall, drought, extreme temperature, wind. And the biotic factors are the things that, that eat them or kill them through disease. So predators, um, parasitoids. So parasitoids are a parasite um, which have a sort of free living stage as well. Um, so the parasitoids that you'll most often come across are the little parasitic wasps. Have, have you seen those around? Yeah. And um, so, so basically the, the, par the wasp, the adult, is the free living stage. Then the female injects an egg into the aphid body and then um, the, the egg hatches and the, the larva develops inside the, the body. So that's the, the parasite stage. Uh, and then insects, just like us, um, suffer from a range of, of diseases, which might be due to fungi, bacteria, or viruses. Next slide, please. So I think my view is that the reason, the main reason why pest numbers go up and down, at least in temperate climates, is, is the weather. Um, and so, yeah, it's the weather that determines whether it's a good year or a bad year uh, for a pest. And I think that's probably the same for many plant diseases as well. Next slide, please. Um, and the weather, depending on what the species is, uh, can have a range of effects. And, and I've just picked some here. So carrot fly eggs um, are very susceptible um, to heat and desiccation if it's very dry. Um, although obviously a lot of carrot crops are, are irrigated. Um, I've already said the diamondback moth doesn't survive UK winters very well. Um, peach potato aphid ad adults, so although, as I say, because we're a temperate country, they overwinter as the active stages, 
they are very susceptible. So if we do have either a very cold snap or a very wet snap period, then those aphids will decrease in numbers. Um, and then one species is what I did my PhD on, cutworm, turnip moth, um, caterpillars, um, and it's well known that the, the young caterpillars are very susceptible to rainfall. Um, so if it rains um, hard when, say, they're just hatching, then, then there'll be high uh, mortality. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of, of predators and parasitoids, then that can be a whole range of different species. Um, so it can be, often be other insects, um, spiders. Um, spider population can be absolutely huge in, in, in crops, money spiders, and I've seen some spectacular fields just full of webs. Um, small mammals, birds, um, and some of those predators are specialists, so they'll specialise on, on, say, one group of insects, for example, aphids, and others will be generalists and they'll just eat whatever they bump into. Next slide, please. Um, and people of, often talk about beetles, about carabid beetles, um, and indeed some of those are predators, um, but some of them are actually um, plant feeders, and some of them feed on, on rotting materials. They're not all predators. Um, and the ones that are predators, they're generalists, so they may feed on a, a wide range of things, so what they bump into. Um, and often um, what they actually consume is, is related to size, so a big beetle will eat bigger things um, than, a, than a small beetle. Next slide, please. Um, another very effective predator is um, a hoverfly larva. Um, so I'll show you an adult, I'm sure you've seen adult hoverflies anyway. Uh, I'll show you one in a minute. Um, and they uh, particularly specialise on aphids. So the female hoverfly will lay um, eggs on a plant where there are aphids present. Um, and then they hatch into these rather nasty looking larvae. And then they, they do just, I mean, I know they're hoverflies because of the, the adult, but they do hoover hoover up um, the aphids, and I had a colleague who used to call them hoover flies. Um, but they, yeah, they can be very effective um, predators, and that, that's just some work we did a while ago. So the green is the, the cabbage aphid colonies, and the black line is the numbers of hoverfly larvae that we found. And the tr I guess in terms of aphids, the problem with all these predators and diseases is that they often arrive a bit too late um, to stop things sort of kicking off. Next slide, please. And there's the adult hoverfly. I say, I'm sure you've, you've all seen that. Next one. And then this is um, a species of parasitic wasp, so a parasitoid. Um, this is a species that, that um, goes for cabbage aphid, amongst other things. And these things are, we call them mummies, aphid mummies, because they, they mummify the aphid. And, and as the, the little larva is feeding inside the aphid's body, say the, the sort of cuticle becomes harder and harder and sort of goldy coloured, and then the, the wasp pops out of the, out of the mummy and, and off it goes. Um, so again, cabbage aphid colonies, parasitised aphids, the black line, and again, it, they usually arrive a bit too late. Um, the other issue that people have noticed with parasitic wasps in general is, the, is what we call hyperparasitism, where actually the parasitic wasps are parasitised by another parasitoid. So, so if you like, there's another layer in the, the food chain, and that can actually reduce the efficacy of the, you know, the thing that you're trying to use to kill the aphids. Next slide, please. 